prayer and then get into today's message. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we come before you in awe and wonder of who you are and what you've done. And now as we open your word, Lord, prepare our hearts and minds and anoint the words that come out of my mouth. May everybody learn something today that they can take home and apply to their lives and grow closer to you and grow stronger as a Christian. And just bless us now. Open our hearts and our minds to you. Holy Spirit, come and fill us and teach us and guide us. Anoint this time. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are just journeying through the Bible, verse by verse. And we are in Matthew chapter 21. And this is the first part. So we just finished up chapter 20 last time. So... It's interesting if you look at, at the whole book as a whole, you know, in pieces, it's chapter 1 through chapter 20 spans like three years of time of Jesus' ministry, right? But now we start in chapter 21 to the end of the book, it all covers one week. So this, this next couple chapters is going to be kind of intense, Jesus' last week as he goes, heads towards the cross. But now, chapter one, 21 starts the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry. So, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to start reading in the first verse, which says, Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. So Bethphage is it's kind of up in the upper part of the Mount of Olives. It's like three quarters of a mile from Jerusalem. And the, the Temple Mount is right down in there too. So you come out of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, down into a valley, and then you walk up a hill, and that's the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus is coming the other direction, over the top of that hill. It was fun that Nancy and I, on our 10th wedding anniversary, went to Israel for like 13 days, and we actually walked What I presume is the road that Jesus came in on. But we walked up the hill instead of he comes up over the top. Anyway, it's a short walking distance, three quarters of a mile. It's not that far. So as Jesus approached Jerusalem, they come up over the top of the hill. And then on the Mount of Olives, you can look out and see all of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. And it's, it's quite a view. So they come up over the top of the hill. And that's where Jesus says, go, you know, over there, there's a donkey, bring it back to me. You know, just tell them the Lord has need of it. You know, in today's world, it'd be like sending somebody, go over there and steal that car for me, bring it to me. (laughs) You know, if, no, yeah, he's going to ride it in a car, but anyway, (laughs) if somebody catches you, just say the Lord needs it. It's all good. But how would that go over in today's society, right? We're more liable to to get shot than have a conversation. Stealing my car, you shoot first, ask questions later. Anyway, but I think it's cool how God has prepared the hearts of the owners of the donkey. Before he even sent the disciples, he knew that person would say, oh, Lord needs it. Yes, take them, please. Prepared the hearts. I think it's cool how he does prepare the hearts of his people. When you have need, somebody has the answer. And God prepares their heart for them to help you. I have run into that many times. but And that is really cool. Anyway, you can go anywhere around the world and come across Christians like Craig was talking about last week and it's like God hooks you up even in foreign countries he's prepared their heart to meet you and welcome you and it's like family brothers and sisters taking care of each other so 
You might be asking, why is this happening? Why did Jesus come up over the hill and say, go get me a donkey? Right? So let's read on verse 4 and find out. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So, Jesus is quoting Zechariah 9.9 here. And it still amazes me how God tells us what's going to happen before it happens. You know, the Old Testament talked about this. All of the prophecies of Jesus Christ, Zechariah 9.9, saying this is what's going to happen. So be ready. When you see this, it's God writing in, right? And he tells it years, decades, and centuries before it happens. I mean, I had a dream. God told me in a dream, I was going to have a son. And that was like two years before I even met his mother. And I I wasn't even going to church or following him at that time. I believed God existed. I believed Jesus. I believed Jesus was the son of God and all that. But my life didn't reflect it. But God still reached down and touched me in a dream and said, Jim, you're going to have a son and he's going to be a leader in my church. I'm like, oh, Okay. And that was two years before I met Nancy. It was like awesome. But can you, you know, these things Jesus or God told the world in his so far in advance. It's like, is there any other religion or God on earth that can do that? There isn't. Our God is amazing and awesome. So anyway, they go get the donkey, and Jesus jumps on the colt. So they're riding down into town. So, you know, what is this picture? Riding on a donkey, it signifies humility and surrender. The king of the Jews coming into town in humility and surrender. You got to remember back in the, or forward, (laughs) in the book of Revelation, right? This hasn't happened yet. When Jesus comes back the second time, which we're keeping an eye out for right now, right? He's going to be riding on a white horse in victory and triumph. What a glorious day that's going to be. But here, the first time Jesus comes is a humble servant sacrificing himself for the world. You know, he's the king, but serving and sacrificing, riding on a beast of burden, a donkey. It's quite a picture. So the disciples did as Jesus asked. Let's read on, verse 6. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on, on them and set him on it on them and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road others cut down branches from the trees and spread them out on the road so if you remember this is the first palm sunday right they put their clothes and palm branches to make the way for jesus to enter so the the city of jerusalem was teeming with people right they all coming Probably two million or more converge on the city to to commemorate Passover. So Passover is an event that had taken place 1,500 years earlier, right, when God led Israel out of Egypt. They did the first Passover. But here, Jesus... The Passover lamb heads into Jerusalem where he will orchestrate a massive public demonstration. (laughs) You know, as he offers himself to be the king of the Jews, the king of Israel. But keep in mind that normally Jesus moved quietly 
in preferred obscurity. You remember what he said? He healed many people and said, shh, don't tell anybody. Right? We kind of marveled at that. that you, you're saving people's lives and you're healing them and the blind see and the lame walk. And we're not supposed to tell anybody. But now he's making a public entrance, riding on a donkey and the crowd's going nuts and throwing their clothes and palm branches. All this is going on. Can you imagine what the Romans thought, the, the Roman soldiers? They're hanging out in Jerusalem and saying, what is this, you know? This is their king? Well, they, I don't know if they thought that yet, but, you know, think about it. They'd be like, yeah. <laughs> he's riding on a donkey, a foal, you know. To them, that would be humiliating. You know, when a Roman leader comes into town, what's he? He's riding a black stallion, big, with all his shiny armor on, full, you know, with chariots and thousands of soldiers behind him. It's like a big, per, you know, it's impressive, Right? But the king of the Jews comes on a donkey, meek and mild. What a contrast. The world, <laughs> bright, shiny, and glittery, and big, massive, prideful, and our God, humble, serving, meek, mild. But still, the crowd following Jesus was creating quite a stir as we read on in verse 9. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is quoting Psalms 118.26. You know, the crowd is shouting Hosanna, which means save us now. Save us now, Messiah. To the son of David. When they say that, it's a messianic title. It means they're basically calling him Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's also saying you're our Messiah. Messianic title. Hosanna in the highest. So they're saying Messiah. Messiah, save us now. You're blessed. Oh, our Messiah, save us now. Glory in the highest. But what they're really saying in their hearts, in their minds, is what? Overthrow the Roman yoke politically. Help us economically. Lead us militarily. Save us now. There's a contrast there too, right? <laughs> no wonder as the week went on and they realized that Jesus wasn't going to do that. Jesus didn't come to throw the Romans out and fix their economy and lead them militarily. They realize Jesus isn't living up to their expectations. I've often wondered, how can people go from calling him Messiah and throwing their clothes on the street in front of him so quickly in one week from now they're going to be yelling, crucify him. You don't live up to our expectations. We just want you dead. Away with you. <laughs> Comes down to Jesus being different than what they expected. You know, we can be fickle when things don't turn out how we plan them either. How often you go to God and say, God, this is how it should happen. This is my plan. Bless it. That's what they're doing. My plan is get rid of the Romans and help us economi economically <laughs> blah, blah, blah. and lead us. Be our king now. How often do we, and then we get mad when God says, no, that's not a good plan. But then, you know, a couple of years later, you look back at it and say, wow, God's plan was way better than my plan. I've done that way too often. <sighs> so they thought Messiah was going to come and run the Romans off and take over the land for the Jews. But looking forward to Revelation again, 
Jesus will come back, and he will set up his kingdom. And we call it the millennial reign for a thousand years. But that hasn't happened yet. That's his second coming. But his first coming was to take care of our sin problem, not our economical situation. And I don't know about you, but I thank him for that. He came to die on the cross, shed his blood so that we could be washed clean. Our sins washed away, past, present, and future sins. That's what Jesus accomplished on the cross. For all those who would believe and accept that free gift, you can reject it. But he humbled himself, served us all and gave all that he had. He gave up everything. But they didn't like that part, right? He didn't live up to their expectations, so they wanted to kill him, which we'll see in you know future sermons. So we just need to realize and remember Jesus came to die for our sins and pay for our iniquities. If he never does anything else in our lives for us, is that not enough that he paved the way for you to be able to go to heaven and have a relationship with God, the creator of the universe? Would that not be enough to merit our loyalty? our affection, our service, our gifts. If that was the only thing he did for us, would we still not owe him eternal devotion? But yet we expect him to fill our bank accounts and heal our bodies. These things are temporary. They're going to get broken. They're going to get sick. Yes, he heals some people and he doesn't heal other people. And we pray that people get healed. But sometimes the answer is no. If he never does another thing for me, if he never gives another blessing to me, I owe him my life because what he did on Calvary. Let's read on. Verse 10. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? What's going on? What's this ruckus? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. <laughs> so the people in the city are saying, What's going on? Who is this? But the people who are following Jesus and been following him, seeing all these healings and stuff, said, This is Jesus, the prophet. <laughs> So even as they're shouting, Messiah, save us now, they only see him as a prophet. What? It's, I find that to be a big gap in their mind. They don't even listen to what they're saying. Like how often do we do that? How many people like show up to church on Sunday and it's just a show, but then you go to their house on Monday and it's a totally different person? You say the right things on Sunday. This is Palm Sunday. They're saying the right thing. Messiah, save us now. But what they really, and then they turn around and say, oh, he's a prophet. Ask yourself, is Jesus your Messiah? Is he your king? Is he your Lord? Or is he something else? People don't even know what they believe. If you don't know what you believe, dig into the Bible, read it, ask God to help you understand it, and you will come out the other side having some firm foundation to stand on, knowing what you believe. If you have questions, come to me or come to Craig or come to another Christian that you know studies the Bible. It's easy to get caught up in the moment, right? Who is this? Oh, Messiah, he's a prophet, but ah, let's party. 
Let's get caught up in it. But yet they don't understand what they're doing. It's like so many people we see on TV now, they're demonstrating for whatever their cause is. But when you go ask them questions about it, well, their answers don't make sense. Or they're just there because a friend asked them to come. Hey, it'll be fun. We'll cause some trouble. That seems to be the way of the world right now. They're caught up in a movement, but they don't understand why. And they don't understand the ramifications of it. Do you know what you believe? Do you know why you're here? And does what you believe affect how you live your life? Does it affect you? Does it affect your relationships in your neighborhood, at work? Do the people around you know that you believe in God, that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? I can't answer that question for you. That's a personal think about that throughout the week. So now we arrive in Jerusalem, and Jesus enters the temple. Verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple and God, uh, the temple of God, and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So when Jesus came into the city, the multitude must have thought he would head straight to the fortress of Antonia to deal with the Romans, right? Come save us now. Get rid of the Romans. Head straight to the fortress. and But instead, he went straight to the temple to deal with the Jews. And I'd be like, what? And there, you know, it's Passover. Things are crazy. People are everywhere. And we see in the temple a place they call the Bazaar of Annas. You know what a bazaar is? kind of like a flea market, farmer's market kind of thing. Annas was the chief priest at that time. And he was exploiting the people and getting rich doing it. Fleecing the flock, you know. And you need to understand that all men, 20 years and over, who came into the city for Passover, had to pay a tax. It was a half a shekel per person. So they would come into town to Passover, and they had to go to the temple and pay their tax. The problem was that the Roman coin was the currency of the day. So everybody coming into town was, had cur- uh, Roman coins. But the problem is that they considered Roman coins to be pagan, and you can't bring pagan stuff to offer in God's temple. So you had to exchange your Roman coins for shekel so you could pay your temple tax. So the Jews, the bad guy Jews, we'll call them, set up money exchange tables. Or you could go and say, here's some Roman coins, and you get your your shekels to pay your tax. (laughs) But Annas, Annas would have the money changers charge an exorbitant amount, sometimes as high as 25%. So it wasn't a coin for a coin, right? It was, you give me your coins, you give me your coins, and I'll give you my coins. That's not a good rate if you've ever exchanged money. Then, on top of that, they had animal fees. Because it's Passover. Everybody needs a lamb, right? You must bring your Passover lamb to the temple to be sacrificed. Then you take it home and you eat it during Passover. And one lamb would cover about ten people in a household. So, coming from all over the countryside, from sometimes pretty far away, it would be hard to bring a lamb from home. 
Remember, they had to be spotless and without blemish, right? So if you're traveling a long way with a lamb, what happens if you accidentally drop it or it trips or, you know, accidents happen, right? So bringing a lamb from home could be dangerous. It might get hurt or blemished. So a lot of people, what they would do is just show up in Jerusalem and buy one there. But again, Annas and the den of thieves would charge an exorbitant amount, sometimes 10 times the going rate for the lamb. That's, <laughs> imagine going down to the car dealer and you need a car. <laughs> Well, that's not a good example, but, you know, 10 times the going rate. That is highway robbery. But you think, even if you brought your own lamb from home, they still get you. Because they charge an inspection fee. You brought your own lamb, fine, but, you know, we got to inspect it, make sure that it's free of blemish sickness or defect and how often do you think that their lambs passed now oh, find some sort of defect or blemish right <laughs> so what happens then then you have to buy there you brought your lamb and you still have to buy their lamb plus you paid the inspection fee to get your lamb inspected so all these fees add up There was no way around it, you know. They had you coming and they had you going. So it's totally understandable why Jesus got angry with these people. I mean, they're fleecing the flock. They're hindering the people. They're charging outrageous things. So I think Jesus had every right to go in there and get mad and flip the tables and run them off. And he quotes Isaiah 56, 7, when he says, My house shall be called a house of prayer. And then he quotes Jeremiah 7, 11, But you have made it a den of thieves. So Annas and his band of thieves have made themselves an obstacle to the people, right? People coming all over there, worship God and do Passover. But this band of thieves is robbing them along the way. It's a, he's hindering their access to God. A priest or a pastor, in today's terminology, is someone who should do everything in their power to help you draw closer to God. Those pastors out there that are fleecing the flock, they are causing a hindrance, a gap between you and God. We're here to help you draw closer to God, not put roadblocks in the way, to not rob you and steal from you. Anybody that says, give me $1,000 and I'll pray for you and God will bless you tenfold is lying to you. God wants your commitment and your service. He doesn't need your money. Giving tithes and offerings is for you. It's saying, I believe you, God. When you serve other people, you serve the church, you serve your neighbors, you serve people at work, you're saying, I believe you, God. I'm going to give of myself like you gave of yourself. And you draw closer to God. So Jesus is rightfully angry. Did you know that uh, anger is not a sin? Some people think, you know, oh, you're angry, be careful. It's what you do with your anger that leads to sin, but anger in and of itself is not a sin. So just in case you were wondering. Here's a good question. What makes God mad? Anybody ever think about that? I know what makes me mad. 
Sometimes I know what makes you mad. But what really makes God mad? I came up with a little list of things. And the first one is when people refuse to do what God called them to do. I know there's like a little rabbit trail from it, but, you know, it kind of struck me. Exodus 3 and 4, we see Moses talking with God. God set a bush on fire, and it wasn't being consumed. And Moses is like, huh, interesting. So he goes over, and he starts talking to God, and God says, I want you to go into Egypt and lead my people out. <laughs> and Moses says, who am I that I should go? Who, who am I? What if they don't listen to me? What if they don't believe me? What if, what if, who am I? I am not eloquent. I don't speak so good. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. I don't want to go. What kind of excuses do y'all make? I've made lots of excuses in the past, but, you know, I have said yes to a lot of them, too. And it says, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses when he said these things. He's like, send somebody else, God. I don't want to play. I'm comfortable out here in the wilderness raising my animals. I've got my wife and my kids and my tent. I'm good. James 4.17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So a lot of people think sin is bad things you do. Bad actions. Right? This is looking at it a little different. Sometimes things we don't do when God asks us to do them That is sin. When God said, it's time to be Pastor Jim, when, the, when Pastor Devin, the guy I took over from, left, God said, it's time to step up. I'm like, who am I? I'm willing, but who am I? I can't do it without you. He says, I'm with you, just like he did with Moses. But I said, I'm willing. I don't feel like I'm able, but with you, all things are possible. So I stepped up to be pastor. You can ask Nancy how big of a step that was for me. I'm an, I was born an introvert, lived most of my life as an introvert, didn't like people. But God changed me. And I'm excited to see what God has done with me. I feel like I'm a better person because I said yes. Sometimes it's scary getting up here. What if I say something stupid? Well, that's who I am. I say stupid things. But God still loves me, right? And y'all still love me, I hope. Number two, God gets angry when people complain. Oh, <laughs> I'm guilty of this one too, right? Didn't go the way I wanted it to go. Numbers 11, verse 1 says, Now, when the people complained... It displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. Talking about the, the Israelites going through the wilderness. He was taking care of their food and their clothing and their, you know, their housing. He was leading them. They had food and water, everything that they needed. And yet they're like, oh, we would have been better off in Egypt where they had cucumbers. Complained, oh, we want meat. You know, God led the Jews out of Egypt and fed them, clothed them, took care of all their needs, and yet they wanted more. Or even worse, they wanted to go back to Egypt. <laughs> it makes you go, huh? But ask yourself, are you a complainer? Do you want more than what you need? 
Has God not given you everything and more? I know I look at my life and say I am way more blessed than I should be. God has been really good. If you don't feel blessed in your life right now, go to a third world country for a week and get a dose of reality. Or go to Chicago. No. Do you value something more than God? Good questions to ask. Number four, God gets angry when people disobey the word of God. That's why I like teaching verse by verse through the Bible so we don't miss anything, so we know what he expects and we can apply his word to our lives. But the problem is once you know the word, then you have to obey the word because disobedience to the word is displeasing, right? Isaiah 5, 20 through 25 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Kind of sounds like today's society, right? How much can you drink? Woo! I can stand on my head and drink from a keg. I can drink till I puke. And people pat you on the back for that. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drinks. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. So you ask yourself, do you read the word of God? Do you practice the word of God? And if the answer is no, if not, then what do you do? What do you worship? You know, we all have an inherent need to worship God. And if you don't worship him, you are going to worship something be it yourself, money, power, pride, other gods. And there's a lot to choose from. Anyway. The fifth and final thing on my list was when pastors fail to lead, which is more for teachers and stuff. Zechariah 10, 2 and 3 says, For the idols speak delusions, the diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their ways like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herds. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock the house of Judah, and will make them as his royal horse in the battle. So those are a few things that make God mad, you know, it's, but pastors that don't lead their people, or they lead their people astray is even worse. That's another reason why I want to read the whole Bible to you. I read it verse by verse and try to teach it in context because I take this seriously. You know, as pastor, I'm held to a higher standard by God. If I stand up here and tickle your ears, does that benefit anybody? It doesn't. But when I stand up here and preach the truth, however hard that may be for you to hear or for me to speak, I hope that I challenge you to grow and to get closer to God. 
And I hope that I help you get closer to God. And if I fall short of that, please tell me or start throwing things at me. It's a serious thing. And so many pastors in today's society don't. They just want bigger incomes. How do you do that? Well, you tickle people's ears so you get more people in and you have big programs that are exciting and bring people in. Why? Because it increases your giving units, increasing your giving units increases your income. And if you get paid as a percentage of the income of the church as a pastor, which I think is wrong, but, you know, I'm just me. For pastors to make millions of dollars, I think is wrong. You could take a million dollars and pay 10 people $100,000 a year. I think that would be more fair and more helpful and get more people in the game. I get emails from a, a, a ministry called Ministry Watch. And how many pastors or secretaries or people embezzling from the church? It's like sad. Or how many pastors are flying around the country in their private jet? Like, why? I've heard of pastors who have multiple campuses and they get a full salary from each campus. Like, why? Why? Why do you need that much? Why not take some of that money and help others, hire more people into the church? If you're making more than 100000 a year, I think that's excessive for a pastor. The Bible says that the, the worker's worth is wages, yes. But when you go so far above and beyond, it's, it's, it's like these Jews in the temple. You're robbing the people to line your bank account. You know, some commentaries say that Annas, the leader of the band of thieves, in today's money was pocketing close to $3 million a year just on Passover. In my mind, that's wrong. And there's pastors that do that today. And it breaks my heart. They need to be preaching the word and helping the people draw closer to God. But I have some good news to leave you with. <laughs> you want to hear some good news? Did I put you all asleep? It's okay to talk to me. I know it's Sunday morning, but anyway, good news. God is slow to anger and rich in mercy. That's exciting. Psalms 103. Psalms 30 says God's anger is for a moment. But his favor is for a lifetime. I think that's exciting. And the best news, God's anger was satisfied by Christ's death on the cross. He paid the price so that we could stand before God and have that relationship. Romans 5, 8 and 9. So as you go through your week this week, think about these things. Think about what you're doing. Is what you're doing pleasing to God or displeasing? Are you stirring his anger is he your Messiah, or is he just a prophet? I challenge you to think about what you believe in every aspect of life. How does God fit into your bank account? How does God fit into your job? How does God fit into your Monday through Saturday lifestyle at home? Find out what you believe and live according to that belief. Life is so much easier when it's consistent. Christianity is not a Sunday event. It's a seven-day-a-week lifestyle. 
It's a relationship with the creator of the universe. Tap into that. How do you do that? Read your Bible. Ask God to help you understand it. He will open your mind. I know I've been there. I used to think that I knew the Bible. You know, I went to Sunday school under my grandma. My grandpa was a Nazarene preacher. But then when we got older, my mom got away from the church because she got divorced, and they didn't like that, so she left, and so I was churched as a young kid. I knew the Bible, the Sunday school stories, and so my whole life, that's, that was the Bible, the Sunday school stories. And then one day, well, over a few days, I, a couple of months, actually, I started having conversations with God while I was driving to work, and he finally challenged me. He says, what does my word say about that, Jim? I'm like, oh, I don't know. That didn't fit into the Sunday school, you know, Noah's Ark and all of those things in the flood. And I'm like, I don't know. So, and then we have another conversation the next day. And he's like, what does my Bible say about that, Jim? I'm like, I don't know. So finally, he's like, why don't you read it? I'm like, well, maybe that's a good idea. And while you're at it, read the Bible, find a church, start attending it, and pay tithes. That's what he told me. I'm like, okay. So finally I went home and said, Nancy, God told me we've got to go to church, and we've got to pay tithe, and we've got to start reading the Bible. And she's like, okay, let's do it. And my life has never been the same since. I didn't understand what God's Word said, and he... I started reading it, and he opened my mind to it, and the more he did, the more excited I got, the more I wanted to read, and 20 years later, here I am, reading it to you, trying to, I'm still learning, don't get me wrong, when I study throughout the week, I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm growing closer to God, I'm excited, and then I come here on Sunday and, you know, try to give you some of the highlights of what God has been working on throughout the week, and it, it's exciting. Can you get excited about the Word of God? So many people say, oh, it's boring to read the Bible. Boring, you're reading it wrong. Read it with the intent of applying it to your life. Yes, that goes against what the world says. Yes, your family and friends and coworkers may reject you for the sake of God, but Oh, as we learned a couple weeks ago, when you lose those families and those friends and you join the kingdom of God, does anybody remember how much you get? Like a hundredfold? Is that the number? A hundred times you get new family and new friends, new adventures. It's exciting. Dear Lord, thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and being willing to sacrifice yourself for us. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for your word. Help us to, to just love it more and want it more, to read it and live it, to have a deep understanding and relationship with you. Open all of our hearts and minds to you this week. Oh, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.